away. The Judiciary Committee will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on oversight of the Department of Justice. I'll begin by recognizing myself for an opening statement. Good morning. Today we welcome Attorney General Jeff Sessions for the Judiciary Committee's annual Department of Justice oversight hearing. Mr. Attorney General, you have a long and distinguished career in public service. You've continued that service by leading the Department of Justice, an agency that, by its very nature, is prone to controversy because of the public's varied opinions on what it seeks to see, what it means to seek and obtain justice. However, you clearly understand that the department you lead must have the confidence of the American people, even when your decisions are not always well received. Your first year leading the Department of Justice has not been without difficulty which is expected at the outset of a new administration. While much has been done to correct the improper political engagement by the Department of Justice under the Obama administration, more work must be done to ensure the department is operating to impartially administer justice. Our last DOJ oversight hearing was beyond disappointing. Attorney General Loretta Lynch gave the least fulsome and least transparent testimony that I can recall in my time in Congress. It was plainly a disservice to the American people. Ms. Lynch failed to respond substantively to nearly every question posed by members of this committee. Before Ms. Lynch, former Attorney General Eric Holder became the first Attorney General in history to be held in contempt by the House of Representatives for his own stonewalling with regard to documents connected to the reckless operation Fast and Furious. I expect, Mr. Attorney General, that you will be more willing to candidly answer questions from members on both sides of the aisle. You're going to hear question after question today concerning your knowledge of or involvement with Russia and its alleged efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Whether it concerns your work on behalf of now President Trump during the campaign or your service in the Senate, I suspect this theme will be a constant refrain from my friends on the other side of the aisle. While I understand your decision to recuse yourself was an effort by you to do the right thing, I believe you, as a person of integrity, would have been impartial and fair in following the facts wherever they led. I have chosen, as chairman of this committee, to let special counsel Robert Mueller do his job, free from undue political influence. At the same time, however, this committee will do its duty and conduct oversight of the Department of Justice. To that end, we sent two letters to you, one in July and another in September, calling on you to name a second special counsel to restore the public's confidence in our justice system. Numerous matters connected to the 2016 election remain unresolved. To date, the Department has not appointed a second special counsel. Consequently, this committee had no choice but to open our own joint investigation with the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee to review DOJ and FBI's handling of the investigation into former Secretary Hillary Clinton and her mishandling of classified information. As we said earlier this year, it is incumbent on this committee in oversight capacity to ensure that the agencies we oversee are above reproach and that the Justice Department, in particular, remains immune to accusations of politicization. Whoever is Attorney General, the Justice Department must even-handedly administer justice. You have recused yourself from matters stemming from the 2016 election, but there are significant concerns that the partisanship of the FBI and the Department has weakened the ability of each to act objectively. I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this and what steps you are taking to remove politics from law enforcement. However, these investigations are but a few of the many important issues we need to discuss today. For instance, we just overwhelmingly reported the USA Liberty Act out of committee last week. 
This bipartisan legislation would reauthorize Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The administration has chosen to oppose any reform of the law. I understand the desire for a clean reauthorization of this vital program. However, I believe this stance is a miscalculation that risks further eroding trust in our intelligence apparatus. We hope we can work with you now that the USA Liberty Act, which reauthorizes a law that is vital to our nation's battle against terrorism while protecting American civil liberties, has been reported out of the committee. This is especially important given the ongoing threat of terrorist attacks in the United States. As we all know, not two weeks ago, eight people were killed and almost a dozen injured when an ISIS-inspired jihadist drove a rented pickup truck into a crowded bicycle path near the World Trade Center in New York. The terrorist threat is real and ongoing. We cannot afford to play politics with national security. I also look forward to continuing to work with you on efforts to reform our nation's criminal justice system. There is bipartisan support to do this in Congress, and with your help, we can make changes that crack down on violent offenders while also doing more to rehabilitate federal prisons and curb abuses in the system, as well as excessive punishments. To your credit, since you assumed leadership of the Department of Justice, there has been a significant increase in the prosecution of firearms offenses in the United States. For years, I have criticized lax enforcement of the gun laws already on the books. Enforcing these laws is the most effective way to combat violent crime in our cities and neighborhoods. Under your leadership, the number of defendants charged with unlawful possession of a firearm has increased by nearly 25 percent. The number of defendants charged with armed drug trafficking has increased 10 percent. I commend you for your focus on these prosecutions because they will help make our streets safer. There are many other matters on which we share common ground, especially when it comes to rectifying the failures of the Obama administration. For example, Earlier this year, the House passed legislation to ban settlement payments to non-victim third parties following your policy directive to shut down the use of such mandatory donations. These reform initiatives followed a concerted effort by the Obama administration to use settlements to benefit its political allies. We commend your efforts to combat illegal immigration, protect our citizens from criminal aliens, and to fight back against so-called sanctuary cities. More than two years have passed since Kate Steinle was murdered by an illegal immigrant who had been deported five times. We have addressed this issue head-on by moving legislation to combat sanctuary cities and find and remove criminal gang members. <clears throat> Mr. Attorney General, our country is at a crossroads. Our constituents are gravely concerned that our justice system does not work for them. Under your leadership, the Justice Department has taken strides to mitigate the harms done in the prior administration. I implore you to work with us to continue that trend, and I thank you sincerely for your appearance here today. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Top of the morning. Uh, in the ordinary course of business, any one of a dozen topics related to the Department of Justice would be worthy of its own hearing. And to be clear, I would rather spend our time today discussing the upkeep of the criminal justice system, the enforcement of civil rights, and the work we must all do to ensure access to the ballot box. Instead, we must spend our time debating the troubles of a wayward administration, how the Attorney General conducts himself before Congress, how President Trump undermines the integrity of the justice system, and how the Department continues to ignore the oversight requests of this committee. Although this is the Attorney General's first appearance before the House, he's already made three visits to our colleagues in the Senate. At his confirmation hearing, he testified that he did not have communications with the Russians. Last month, he testified that a continuing exchange of information 
between Trump surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government did not happen, at least to my knowledge, and not with me. We now know, of course, that neither of these statements is true. Shortly after the Attorney General made the first comment, the Washington Post reported that he met with the Russian ambassador at least twice during the campaign. In the past month, we've also learned that the Attorney General must have been very much aware of a continuing exchange of information between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. In charging documents unsealed last month, George Papadopoulos, a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, admits to extensive communications with Russian contacts. At a March 31, 2016 meeting of the campaign's National Security Advisory Committee, attended by candidate Trump and chaired by Senator Sessions, Mr. Papadopoulos stated in sum and substance that he had connections that could help arrange a meet meeting between then candidate Trump and President Putin. It does not matter and has been reported that the Attorney General remembers this meeting after the fact remembers it so vividly, in fact, that two unarmed sources say the senator shut George down. Under oath, knowing in advance that he would be asked about this subject, the attorney general gave answers that were at best incomplete. I hope the attorney general can provide some clarification on this problem in his remarks today. I also hope that he can assure us that the, Dep the, the department is weathering near daily attacks on its independence by President Trump and that no office of the department is being used to pressure the president's political enemies. In recent months, President Trump has attacked the beleaguered Attorney General and criticized his very weak position on Hillary Clinton crimes, <coughs> in quotation. <coughs> the President has talked openly about firing the leadership of the department, including the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, the former Acting Director of the FBI, and Special Counsel Robert Mueller. He did fire former FBI Director Comey in his own words, quote, because of that Russia thing with Trump and Russia, in quotation, as well as Acting Attorney General Sally Yates and all 46 sitting United States attorneys. Last year, he denigrated a federal judge because of his, quote, Mexican heritage, unquote. And Judge Curiel was born in Indiana, by the way. Last month in a radio interview, President Trump said he was very unhappy with the Justice Department. Hours later, he proclaimed the military justice system a complete and total disgrace. But the one that sticks with me is the President's July interview with the New York Times. In that interview, he begins by once again attacking the Attorney General's credibility. Sessions never should have recused himself, the President complains. And then the conversation takes a sinister turn. When Nixon came along, out of courtesy, the FBI started reporting to the Department of Justice, 
but the FBI person really reports directly to the President of the United States. He goes on. I could have ended the Flynn investigation just by saying they say it can't be obstruction because you can say it's ended, it's over, period. As is often the case, the president requires some correction. The director of the FBI reports directly to the attorney general and has since the founding of the bureau, it can be obstruction of justice <coughs> if the president orders an investigation closed with a corrupt motive. But what strikes me about these comments is the president's view that the criminal justice system serves him and not the public. President Trump seems to believe that on a whim, he can bring pressure to bear on his enemies, dismiss charges against his allies, and insulate himself and his family from any consequence. I cannot overemphasize the danger of this perspective uh, poses to our republic. And I've served on this committee long enough to remember another president who shared this view. I was myself on Richard Nixon's enemies list. And although we worked to hold that administration accountable, our work is not complete. We must all remember our common responsibility to prevent that kind of abuse from happening again. I will look to the Attorney General's partnership in this effort, but I've begun to worry about his resolve. Last night, in a letter sent by the department to Chairman Goodlatte, without so much as a copy to the ranking member, by the way, the Assistant Attorney General seems to leave the door open to appointing a new special counsel to cater to the President's political needs. The fact that this letter was sent to the majority without the customary and appropriate notice to me indicates that the charge given to the department officials to evaluate these issues has political motivations. Now, in his own words, the Attorney General is recused from any questions involving investigations that involve Secretary Clinton. Further, we cannot refer an investigation to a second counsel if we lack the evidence to predicate a criminal investigation in the first place. Virtually every Clinton-related matter that President Trump complains about has been well litigated, carefully examined, and completely debunked. Still. To quote former Attorney General Michael Mukasey, putting political opponents in jail for offenses committed in a political setting is something that we don't do here. The threat alone resembles, in his words, a banana republic. Finally, there is the matter of routine oversight between hearings. In the recent history of this committee, new attorneys generally usually come to see us within two or three months of taking office. No attorney general in recent memory has taken more than six months before making an appearance here. Attorney General Sessions has broken that norm. He has had more than 10 months to settle in making our communications with the department between hearings that much more important. To date, my colleagues and I have sent more than 40 letters to the Trump administration asking for information 
necessary to carry out our oversight responsibilities. We have sent more than a dozen of these letters directly to the Attorney General. To date, we have not received a single substantive response. We can disagree on matters of policy, Mr. Attorney General, but you cannot keep us in the dark forever. When we make a reasonable oversight request, we expect you to reply in a prompt and responsive manner. And I hope you can explain why your department has chosen to ignore these letters. More importantly, I hope that you will be more forthcoming with your answers, both in your testimony today and in the weeks to come. And I look forward to your testimony. And Mr. <coughs> Chairman, I thank you and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Conyers. Without objection, all other members' opening statements will be made a part of the record. We welcome our distinguished witness, and if you would please rise, uh, I'll begin by swearing you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony that you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Let the record show that the witness answered in the affirmative. Mr. Jeff Sessions was sworn in as the 84th Attorney General of the United States on February 9, 2017. From 1996 to his confirmation to lead the Department of Justice, Mr. Sessions served as a United States Senator for Alabama. Previously, Attorney General Sessions served as an Assistant United States Attorney and United States Attorney for the Southern District of Alabama, Alabama Attorney General, and Captain in the United States Army Reserve. Attorney General Sessions is a graduate of Huntington College and the University of Alabama Law School. Welcome, Attorney General Sessions. Uh, your entire written statement will be entered into the record, and uh, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. But I noted that the ranking member took a few more minutes than that. If you find that necessary, please feel free to, to do that as well. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to be before this distinguished committee, having served 20 years on your counterpart in the Senate. The, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I must note that uh, I note with regret your announcement of retirement, and I know uh, uh, that our relationship has been good in the past, and I hope it will continue to be good as you serve here. You've done a fabulous job in leading this committee. On my first day as Attorney General, I spoke about, quote, the critical role we at the department play in maintaining and strengthening the rule of law, which forms the foundation of our liberty, our safety, and our prosperity. It, in this rule of law, we are blessed beyond all nations. So I truly believe that. And at this department, we must do all we can to ensure that it is preserved and advanced. Such ideals transcend politics. From that day to today, we at the Department of Justice have worked to be faithful to that mission. Let me share some things we've done initially. The president sent us an order to reduce crime, not to uh, uh, allow crime to continue to increase, and we embrace that mission. The violent crime rate has risen, and the homicide rate has risen by more than 20% in just two years, really after 30 years of decline in violent crime. After a careful review, we have established a reinvigorated Project Safe Neighborhood Program as the foundational policy for public safety. It has been proven to get results. In its first seven years of implementation, PSN reduced violent crime by 4.1 percent, with case studies showing reductions in certain areas where it was intensely applied of up to 42 percent. So we're also focusing on criminals with guns. As you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, we've seen a 23 percent increase in gun prosecutions in the second quarter of this, first, this fiscal year, my first uh, 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 year. And I'm honored to lead the superb men and women of the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, ATF, and the United States Marshal Service, who work together every day with our state and local partners 
in this core crime fighting mission that is the responsibility of the department. Last year, we saw a staggering 61% increase in the number of law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty because of a felony. And on average, more than 150 officers were assaulted every single day. These numbers are unacceptable. Fortunately, the president understands this. He's directed us at the beginning of my administration to back our men and women in blue. We are making it clear that we stand with our law enforcement partners 100 percent. They are the solution to crime, not the problem. We've also protected the rule of law in our own department. We prohibited so-called third-party settlements that were being used to bankroll uh, special interest groups. We've settled civil cases regarding the Affordable Care Act's birth control mandate, settled the cases of many groups of, of tax-exempt uh, groups whose status was significantly and wrongfully delayed by the Internal Revenue Service. We've also provided legal counsel to this administration in favor of ending several other unlawful policies. This includes President Trump's order ending billions in funding for insurance companies that were not appropriated by Congress under the Affordable Care Act. This action, which the House had filed a lawsuit uh, to stop, put an end to one of the most dramatic erosions of the congressional appropriations power in our history. House members, you are correct to challenge that. You won in the district court. We believed you were correct, and we had that. Uh, we reversed the policy and uh, had that matter um, uh, withdrawn, the policy withdrawn. We put an end to actions by the previous administration to circumvent Congress's duly passed immigration laws on the DACA. The policy gave individuals that were here illegally certificates of lawful status, work permits, and the right to participate in Social Security. We withdrew that unlawful policy and now the issue is in the hands of Congress, really where it belongs. We have filed briefs defending uh, properly enacted state voter identification laws, lawful redistricting plans, religious liberty, and free speech on college campuses. In short, it is our mission to, the report, to restore the American people's confidence in the Department of Justice by defending the rule of law and enforcing the laws as you have passed them. And it is a mission we are honored to undertake. In response to letters from this committee and others, I've directed senior federal prosecutors to make recommendations as to whether any matters not currently under investigation should be open, whether any matters currently under investigation require further resources, and whether any matters uh, under consideration may merit the appointment of a special counsel. Uh, uh, and as you are aware, the department's inspector general has an active review of allegations that FBI policies and procedures were not followed last year in a number of matters that you have addressed. And Mr. Chairman, the letter was addressed to you because it was a response to your letter, uh, and, uh, and that's how it was, was sent. And we will make such decisions without regard, hear me, without regard to politics, ideology, or bias. As many of you know, the department has a long-standing policy not to confirm or deny the existence of investigations. This policy can be frustrating, I understand, especially when there's great public interest about a matter. But it enhances justice when we act under the law with professionalism and discipline. This policy necessarily precludes any discussion uh, on cases I may be recused from because to do so would confirm the existence of underlying investigations. To the extent a matter comes to the attention of my office that may warrant consideration of recusal, I review the issue, consult with the appropriate department ethics officials, and make my decision as I promised uh, the Senate committee when I was confirmed. Lastly, I would like to address the false charges made about my previous testimony. My answers have not changed. I've always told the truth. 
and I have answered every question as I understood them to the best of my recollection, as I will continue to do today. I would like to address recent news reports regarding meetings during the campaign attended by George Papadopoulos and Carter Page, among others. Frankly, I had no uh, recollection of this meeting until I saw these news reports. I do now recall that the March 2016 meeting at the Trump Hotel that Mr. Papadopoulos attended, but I have no clear recollection of the details of what he said at that meeting. After reading his account, and to the best of my recollection, I believe that I wanted to make clear to him that he was not authorized to represent the campaign with the Russian government or any other foreign government for that matter. But I did not recall this event, which occurred 18 months before my testimony of a few weeks ago, and I would gladly have reported it uh, had I remembered it because uh, I pushed back against his suggestion that I thought uh, may have been improper. As for Mr. Page, while I do not challenge his recollection, uh, I have no memory of his presence at a dinner at the Capitol Hill Club or any passing conversation uh, he may have had with me as he left the dinner. All you have been in campaigns, let me just suggest, but most of you have not participated in a presidential campaign and none of you had a part in the Trump campaign. And uh, it was a brilliant campaign, I think, in many ways, but it was a form of chaos every day from day one. We traveled uh, sometimes to several places in one day. Sleep was in short supply. And I was still a full-time senator at a very, with a very full schedule. During this year, I've spent close to 20 hours testifying before Congress before today. I have been asked to remember details from a year ago, such as who I saw on what day, in what meeting, and who said what the when. In all of my testimony, I can only do my best to answer your questions as I understand them and to the best of my memory. But I will not accept and reject accusations that I have ever lied. That is a lie. Let me be clear, I have at all times conducted myself honorably and in a manner consistent with the high standards and responsibilities of the Office of Attorney General, which I revere. I spent 15 years in that department. I love that department. I honor that department and will do my dead level best to be worthy of your Attorney General. So I, as I said before, my story has never changed. I've always told the truth, and I've answered every question to the best of my recollection, and I will continue to do so today. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm honored to take your questions. Well, thank you, General Sessions. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions, and I'll begin by recognizing myself. Under your leadership, the prosecution of firearms offenses have increased 23% over the same period of the previous year. Furthermore, the number of defendants charged with using a firearm in violent crimes of drug trafficking rose 10% over the previous year. We have a slide which shows the increase as compared to the Obama-era numbers. What do these increased prosecutions of firearms offenses indicate about the Department of Justice's commitment to fighting violent crime, particularly with the use of firearms, in this country? Mr. Chairman, as... Um a former federal prosecutor who emphasized gun prosecutions, I've long believed that they have a significant impact in reducing violent crime. Uh, professors of earlier this year have explained that they share that view based on scientific analysis. Uh, it will be a high priority of ours. You are correct that prosecutions fell. One incident that was um, raised uh, during the Texas ter terrific, horrible shooting at the church there in South Sutherland, uh, Texas, uh, um, was the, re the ability of an individual to get a firearm uh, and whether or not they filed correctly their form before you get one. It's, it, it requires questions about um, criminal convictions and court-martials. Uh, those prosecutions, I've noticed, have dropped by 
over 50 percent in the last three or four years. I think those are worthy prosecutions. And when a criminal is carrying a gun during a criminal act of some other kind, that is a clear and, and present uh, danger to the public. And those cases are important in the impact reduction of crime. As you're aware, I and a majority of the members of this committee have on multiple occasions requested a special <coughs> counsel to investigate former Secretary Hillary Clinton's mishandling of classified information and the actions of former Attorney General Lynch with respect to former FBI Director Comey's decision not to prosecute former Secretary Clinton. I am in receipt of the department's letter from yesterday stating that senior federal prosecutors will review our letters and make recommendations as to whether any matters not currently under investigation should be opened, require further resources, or merit the appointment of a special counsel. Do I have your assurance that these matters will proceed fairly and expeditiously? Yes, you can, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you can be sure that they will be done uh, without political influence, and they will be done correctly and properly. You also reference an ongoing Inspector General investigation into many of the matters we have raised. Will you ensure that the IG briefs this committee on his findings in closed session if necessary? Uh, I will do my best to comply with that. The uh, Inspector General is able to announce investigations in a way that we do not on the normal criminal pro side of the Department of Justice, and I assume he would be able to do that. Over the past year, we have seen numerous apparent disclosures of unmasked names of U.S. citizens in the context of intelligence reports. Which crimes are violated when these unmasked names are disclosed, for example, to the press? How does the Department of Justice investigate such unauthorized disclosures? Mr. Chairman, that could implicate a number of uh, legal prohibitions. Uh, it, it could be clearly a release of classified information contrary to law, and it's a very grave offense and certainly goes against the core policies of this government uh, to protect those matters uh, from disclosure. And the second part of your question was how the department investigates such unauthorized. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, members of the committee, we had about nine open investigations of classified leaks in the last three years. We have 27 investigations open today. We intend to get to the bottom of these leaks. I think it reached, has reached epidemic proportions. It cannot be allowed to continue, and we will do our best effort to ensure that it does not continue. And on April 11, you issued a memorandum to all federal prosecutors requesting that they make prosecution of certain immigration offenses a higher priority. To your knowledge, have the number of federal prosecutions increased nationwide for offenses such as harboring aliens, improper entry, and illegal reentry? I do not have the statistics on that, but I believe there have been some increases in those cases. Uh, one thing we've seen is a reduction of attempts to enter the country illegally. Uh, and that is good news and should result in some decline in some prosecutions. Uh, and finally, as you know, this committee did a great deal of work to enact criminal justice reform legislation last Congress. Will you continue to work in good faith with me and the members of this committee on both sides of the aisle to identify and craft responsible reforms? I certainly will, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, General Sessions. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Conyers, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome again, Mr. Attorney General. I'd like to begin by putting a few statements by the President up on the screen. The first from July 24, 2017. So, why aren't the committees and investigators, and of course our beleaguered Attorney General looking into crooked Hillary crimes and Russia relations? The second, from November the 3rd. Everybody's asking why the Justice Department and the FBI isn't looking at all of the dishonesty going on with crooked 
Hillary and the Dems, in quotation. The third, also from November 3rd, Pocahontas just stated that the Democrats lead by the, led by the legendary crooked Hillary Clinton rigged the primaries. Let's go to the FBI and Justice Department. I believe he is referring to Senator Elizabeth Warren in that last one. When Richard Nixon uh, spoke about us that way, at least he had the courtesy to do it behind closed doors. Mr. Attorney General, a few questions for you, yes or no, please. In a functioning democracy, is it common for the leader of the country to order the criminal justice system to retaliate against his political opponents? Is that a question? Yes, that's the question. Is it proper? Is that what you... Uh, uh, no. You answer to me whether it is yes or no, your response. But I didn't quite catch the beginning of the question. I'm sorry. Right. In a functioning democracy, is it common for the leader of the country to order the criminal justice system to retaliate against his political opponents? Uh, Mr. Conyers, I would say that it's, uh, uh, the Department of Justice can never be used to retaliate politically against opponents, and that would be wrong. I interpret that as no. You, you, the answer stands for itself, I guess. Well, I, I would just, that, that would make it a little easier if, if you just responded uh, yes or no, if you can. Here's another. Should the President of the United States make public comments that might influence a pending criminal investigation? Should it take great care in those issues? Could you, could you respond yes or no? Well, I don't know exactly the facts of what you're raising and what amounts to the concern you have. I would say it's improper to influence. Uh, uh, it would be a, a president cannot improperly influence a, an investigation. Okay. And... Uh, I have not been improperly influenced and would not be improperly influenced. The uh, president speaks his mind. Yes, uh, he's uh, bold and direct about what he says. But, the people but I, elected I, him, but uh, we do our duty every day based on the law my, and the facts. Reclaiming my time, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not impugning these uh, comments to you or what you would do in advance. Last night, sir, the assistant attorney general sent the chairman a letter suggesting that the attorney general has directed senior federal prosecutors to uh, evaluate certain issues, like the sale of Uranium One in 2010. Now, at your confirmation hearing, you said, I believe the proper thing for me to do would be to recuse myself from any questions involving those kinds of investigations that involved Secretary Clinton and that uh, were raised during the campaign or to be otherwise connected uh, to it. Now, for my yes or no question, are you recused from investigations that involve Secretary Clinton? Mr. Chairman, uh, it's, I cannot answer that yes or no because under the policies of the Department of Justice to announce recusal uh, in any investigation would reveal the existence of that investigation, mm -hmm. and the top ethics officials have advised me I should not do so. The time of the gentleman has you, expired. You. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, we're debating whether Section 702 should be reauthorized, and I want to talk about that issue. Uh, 
At the beginning, let me show you a poster that my campaign committee put up on the University of Whitewater campus in the 2014 election during the debate on the USA Liberty Act. And it says, the government knows what you did last night. Uh, the NSA has grabbed your phone calls, texts, Facebook posts, and emails. Jim Sensenbrenner thinks that that's an outrageous uh, invasion of your privacy, and it shows that I passed the bill and asked the students to vote for me. It worked. Uh, my percentage on that campus went up 20 points from the previous uh, election. Now, we're talking about many of the same issues in terms of Section 702, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act was designed to collect foreign intelligence, not domestic intelligence. But in reality, we know that a vast number of Americans' communications are also collected. The committee took a great step in trying to balance security and privacy last week uh, when we reported out the USA Liberty Act, which made significant changes to the program. But notably, this legislation specifies two ways the government can query the information under Section 702, either foreign intelligence or evidence of a crime. The USA Liberty Act ensures that the government does not abuse 702 by requiring that a warrant be issued to access content after querying information for evidence of a crime. Now, Attorney General Sessions, you have stated on several occasions <clears throat> that you believe that a warrant requirement would hinder the government's ability to detect and stop terrorists. Yet this bill already provides the government to move forward without a warrant on foreign intelligence in an emergency situation. Why can't the USA Liberty Act be the compromise? Can't we allow the intelligence community to stop terrorists while protecting the constitutional rights of Americans? Well, we can. And the constitutional rights of Americans should be protected. And I know you worked on the Patriot Act when it came up with Senator Hatch and Senator Leahy and others. I know you're a champion of civil liberties. So uh, uh, I would just say that we can do that. The act as written, as in law today, uh, has been approved by the courts and has not by, have been found to be in violation of the law. And so that's first and foremost. I know the committee has decided to put some additional restrictions on the way the act uh, is conducted. Uh, we did not think that was lawfully required. Congress can make its own decisions, and we'll continue to be able to share our thoughts about how the legislation uh, should be crafted. Well, Mr. Attorney General, the day before the committee marked up this bill, the Justice Department was actively lobbying members of the committee to oppose the measure, stating that it would dismantle Section 702. Now, this is a huge gamble because 702 expires at the end of the year. We have a very short timeline, and I want to ask you with a yes or no, following my friend from Michigan, do you want to risk the real possibility that this program will expire by insisting upon a clean reauthorization without a sunset? No, we don't want to take that risk. Will you commit? to working with Congress and not against us uh, to make sure that Section 702 is reauthorized, either the way you want it or the way we want it? Mr. Uh, I almost said Mr. Chairman. I know you've held, held that office. Yeah. Um, Congress gets to dispose. We okay. get to give our opinion. I believe the act as passed, and it has been reauthorized with an even, even larger vote last time, uh, is constitutional. I believe it works, and I am w worried about additional burdens, particularly a warrant requirement, which could be exceedingly damaging to the effectiveness of the act. We're willing to talk to you about some of the concerns that exist out there. Hopefully, we can work our way through it uh, and uh, accept the concerns and but, fix the concerns you have without, without with, going too far. With, with all due respect, there is an emergency exemption uh, in the USA Liberty Act is reported from the committee. And that should take care of the problem. And yet, people in your department were saying this was no good. You know, I, I, I take your offer 
you know, at face value. And I will let you know if I hear of members of your department actively lobbying to defeat the bill rather than to work something out, and yield back the balance of my time. I'm, I know you'll let us know. Mr. Senator Brennan. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Following up on the questions from Mr. Uh, uh, Conyers, at your confirmation hearing, you said, I believe the proper thing for me to do would be to recuse myself from any questions involving these kinds of investigations that involve Secretary Clinton and that were raised during the campaign or to be otherwise connected to it, close quote. Do you stand by that statement, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. Now, I want to show you an image from March 31st, 2016, of a meeting of the Trump campaign National Security Advisory Committee, which you chaired, with yourself in attendance, along with then-candidate Donald Trump and Mr. George Papadopoulos. Mr. Papadopoulos pled guilty on October 5th to making false statements to the FBI. The charging papers filed by Special Counsel Mueller described the March 31st meeting where Mr. Papadopoulos told the group that he had connections and could help arrange a meeting between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. After the meeting, Mr. Papadopoulos continued to communicate with the Russian government on behalf of the Trump campaign and appears to have told several senior campaign officials about it. Now, here's the problem. On October 18th of this year, you said under oath in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee, quote, a continuing exchange of information between Trump's surrogates and intermediaries for the Russian government did not happen, at least not to my knowledge and not with me. Senator Franken asked, you don't believe that surrogates from the Trump campaign had communications with the Russians, to which you responded, I did not, and I'm not aware of anyone else that did, unquote. Now, we now know that, one, the campaign had, communi had communications with the Russians through Mr. Papadopoulos and others, and two, you seem to have been aware of the fact at the time. So let's try and correct the earlier testimony now for the record. Yes or no, did you chair the March 31st, 2016 meeting of the National Security Advisory Committee? I did chair that meeting. Thank you. Did Mr. P yes or no, did Mr. Papadopoulos mention his outreach to the Russian government during that meeting? He made some comment to that effect, yes. as I remember uh, after I have having to, read it in the yes newspaper. I asked for yes or no, I don't have time. Yes. All right. There are reports that you shut George down, in, unquote, when he proposed that meeting with Putin. Is this correct, yes or no? Yes. I Thank pushed you. back, I'll just say it that way, because it was... Um, oh, you, yes, your yes. answer is yes. So you were obviously concerned by Mr. Papadopoulos' connections and his possibly arranging a meeting with Putin. Now, again, yes or no, did anyone else at that meeting, including then-candidate Trump, react in any way to my, what Mr. Papadopoulos had presented? I don't recall. Okay, so your testimony is that neither Donald Trump nor anyone else at the meeting expressed any interest in meeting the Russian president or had any concerns about communications between the campaign and the Russians. I don't recall it. Okay. Now, we know from multiple sources, including the Papadopoulos guilty plea, Carter Page's interview with the Intelligence Committee, and Donald Trump Jr.'s emails, among others, that contrary to your earlier testimony, there were continued efforts to communicate with the Russians on behalf of the Trump campaign. We have established that you knew about at least some of these efforts. They caused you such concern that you, quote, shut George down. I want to know what you did with this information. Yes or no? After the March 31st meeting, did you take any steps to prevent Trump campaign officials, advisors, or employees from further outreach to the Russians? Mr. Nadler, that, let me just say it this way. I pushed back at that. You made statements that he but did, did in fact, at the meeting, I pushed back. You know that, but did you, uh, after the no, meeting? No, I'm not, I have to be able to answer. I can't, I can't uh, be able to uh, no, be put in a position you, yes, where I, I can't explain. I'm, asking you, I'm not going to be able to answer if I can't answer completely. Well, you said you pushed back. We accept that. After the meeting, did you take any further steps uh, to prevent Trump campaign officials, advisors, or employees from further outreach to the Russians after you stopped it or pushed back at that meeting? What I want to say to you is you allege there were some further contacts later. I don't believe I had any knowledge of any further contacts, okay. and I was not in regular contact with Mr. Papadopoulos. So your answer is no because you don't think there were any such contacts. So you I'm not aware of it. Okay. So I, I was going to ask you a question of did you raise the issue with various people, but your answer is no. To the best of my recollection. Okay. Um, so your testimony today is that you communicated with nobody in the campaign about this matter after the March 31st meeting because nothing happened. Repeat that. Your testimony, therefore, is that you communicated with nobody in the campaign about this matter after the March 31st meeting. I don't recall it. You don't recall. At some point, 
you became aware that the FBI was investigating potential links between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. After you became aware of the investigation, did you ever discuss Mr. Papadopoulos' effort with anybody at the FBI? Did I discuss the matter with the FBI? Yes. To ask them questions about what they may have you found? you discuss the Papadopoulos question with the FBI? I have not um, had any discussions with Mr. Mueller or his team or the FBI concerning any factors with regard and to this Nobody else at the FBI either? No. At the Department of Justice? No. At the White House? No. Uh, any member of Congress? Well, uh, I don't know if these conversations may have come up at some time, but not to obtain information. In any, let, okay. With regard to your broad question, I don't recall at this moment, sitting here, any such discussion. Okay. I have one it's important for me to say that. The time of the, the, the gentleman question. has expired. We've got a lot of people waiting to ask questions. And the chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, um, does your recusal from investigations related to the interference by Russia in the 2016 presidential campaign uh, apply to any investigations regarding efforts by the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign uh, to secretly fund uh, a scurrilous and widely discredited dossier on uh, candidate uh, Donald Trump? Mr. Chabot, um, anything that uh, arises in this nature uh, that may be or may not be connected to the, my recusal on the question of the campaign in Russia uh, would be discussed between me, uh, the senior ethics advisor uh, at the Department of Justice, and that's how I make my decision. That's what I promised to do when I was confirmed before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and that's what I will do. And I'm unable to uh, provide information to you as to what decision would be, has been made in this matter. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm not and never was a, a prosecutor, but I did some criminal defense work uh, back in the day when I practiced law for almost uh, 20 years. Um, it seems to me that a presidential campaign using a law firm as a conduit uh, to pay for activities with which the campaign itself doesn't want to be directly associated uh, is more than just dirty politics. Uh, it's also quite possibly illegal. Uh, to me, it seems that this is at least a violation of campaign finance laws for failure to accurately disclose the actual recipients of campaign disbursements. However, this type of arrangement is not illegal, um, if it's not illegal under current law. I fear that we're risking opening Pandora's box with all sorts of underhanded activities by campaigns being laundered through law firms and shielded under attorney-client privilege. As the chief law enforcement official in this country, um, do you share similar concerns? And in your opinion, is it legal under current law for a presidential campaign to hide its funding uh, of the compilation and dissemination of political dirt on its opponent by using a law firm uh, to directly pay for the work? I would think that those matters are worthy of consideration, but as to the details of them and for me to express an ultimate comment today, I'm unable to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, let, let me shift over to something uh, entirely different. Um, federal law currently uh, still cites marijuana as a dangerous drug, uh, it's still prohibited, uh, it's still illegal under federal law, yet uh, a number of states uh, have, uh, for both medical purposes and now even uh, for recreational purposes, have basically made it uh, legal. Um, what is your department's uh, policy on, on that relative to en enforcing uh, the law? Our policy is that the same really fundamentally as the holder lynch policy, which is that the federal law remains in effect and a state can legalize marijuana for its law enforcement purposes, but it still remains uh, illegal with regard to federal purposes. Okay. It, it seems to me that there's always been a tremendous amount of gray, gray area in that whole field, which I think as a nation, you know, we need to look much more closely at, but both from the state's point of view and the federal uh, government uh, point of view. But that, that's just my, uh, my feeling on that. Um, running out of time, I had about four other things, but let me just go to one, one final thing here. Um, 
I've been very uh, involved uh, in the area of victims' rights. I was the, uh, following Henry Hyde's uh, leadership on this, uh, introduced the Victims' Rights Constitutional Amendment years back, uh, various pieces of legislation on, on, on victims' rights. Um, and I've also worked closely with the parents of murdered uh, children. Um, and when you talk about something that affects one's family, there's nothing uh, that affects a family more adversely than something like that happening. And we still have uh, capital punishment on the books, both at the federal level and uh, many of our states. Uh, yet these families are dragged uh, left and right, up and down, back and forth, into hearing after hearing. These cases can drag on for more than 20 years before uh, the uh, imposition of capital punishment actually occurs, and in many instances, obviously, it, it never does. And while these people are behind bars, oftentimes they uh, attack, sometimes kill guards, attack, sometimes kill other inmates. Um, so what, what is, uh, I'd be interested to see, what, what is your, your uh, uh, you, what is your intentions relative to capital punishment in this country? Well, many states have capital punishment. The federal government has capital punishment for a number of offenses, and it's specifically controlled. We have within the department a recommendation process through an our, our appointed committee to seek or not seek a death penalty when a, a case is charged. Sometimes it's a complex thing, but I believe the death penalty, the federal death penalty, is a part of our law. Uh, I, I think it's a legitimate penalty. It's constitutional, and we will do our duty even in those uh, circumstances that require the imposition of the death penalty. Thank you very much. My time's expired. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Attorney General, for being here today. Uh, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn is under investigation because of his work and ties to foreign governments. According to various reports, much of his work with these foreign governments went unreported when Mr. Flynn was required to make certain disclosures by law. Now, as chairman of the Trump uh, campaign, National uh, Security Advisor uh, Committee and lead advisor on the Trump transition team. I think you worked closely with Mr. Flynn, and I'd like you to answer a few yes or no questions about Mr. Flynn. And knowing that Mr. Flynn is under investigation, I'm going to stick to subject matter that predates both the special counsel's <coughs> investigation and your appointment as attorney general. Now, the foreign policy platform at the Republican National Convention undertook dramatic changes. Did you discuss changes to the Republican foreign policy platform with Mr. Flynn at any point during the campaign? I don't recall it. I was not at the convention when the platform uh, committee met. You're, you're the, you were the lead of the campaign, but you don't recall discussing it with him? Well, that may be um, a bit of a stretch. Um, I was asked to um, lead and form and find some people who would join and meet with Mr. Trump to give him advice and uh, support uh, regarding foreign policy, and I did so, although we were not a very uh, effective group, really. You met with Ambassador uh, Kislyak in November of 2016. Did you discuss your meetings with Ambassador Kislyak with Mr. Flynn? Did I discuss Mr. Flynn with him? Did you discuss your meeting with the ambassador with Mr. No. Flynn? The, the ambassador, I met with, I think, some 25 ambassadors that year. I did meet once in my office with Mr. Kislyak. And um, I do not recall and don't believe I communicated any of that information to Mr. Uh, Flynn. Are you aware of any meetings between Ambassador Kislyak and Mr. Flynn that might have occurred around the time of your meeting with the ambassador? I do not. Okay. In her testimony before the Senate in May, former Acting Attorney General Sally Yates testified that one week into the Trump administration, she notified the administration that Mr. Flynn had lied to Vice President Pence about discussing sanctions with Ambassador Kislyak. As part of the transition team and the President's pick for Attorney General, in January, were you notified when the administration was notified of Mr. Flynn's lie 
and his susceptibility to Russian blackmail? Uh, I don't b believe so. All right. We now know that uh, you were aware of the efforts of Carter Page and George Papadopoulos to meet and establish communications with the Russian government. Did you at any point... Well, um, that's not necessarily so about, at least from what Mr. Carter Page says, and I don't recall that. All right. Did you at any point discuss with Michael Flynn the possibility of then-candidate Trump or his surrogates uh, meeting with the Russian government? I do not recall such a conversation. Did you know that Flynn was working for the Turkish government while acting as a surrogate for the Trump campaign? I don't believe I had information to that effect. Did you know that he was working for the Turkish government at any point after the election? I don't believe so. Um, were you or anyone on the Trump campaign aware of Mr. Flynn's efforts to extradite Turkish cleric uh, Gulen? I've read that in the paper recently, um, but uh, I don't um, recall ever being made aware of that before uh, this recent release. So in the you paper. just read about it in the newspaper afterwards? After the inauguration, you, you, did, you did not know that the FBI uh, was requested to conduct a new review of Turkey's 2016 extradition request for Mr. Gulen? The FBI was... Did you know about that? I'm aware that the Turkish government uh, continued to press the federal government with regard to seeking the return of Mr. Gulen uh, to Turkey. Did you know and Our that department um, had a role to play in that, although I'm not at liberty to discuss the details of that. Did you know that the uh, Turkish government allegedly offered $15 million for Mr. Flynn to kidnap Mr. Gulen? Absolutely not. You mean it? No. On Time of the gentlewoman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, General Sessions, for your testimony here today and your service to our country over the years that uh, you have been front and center. And uh, I, um, a number of things I wanted to discuss. Well, one of them is the, the, uh, the DACA situation. And uh, it seems, as I recall, they had made a public statement some time back about the constitutionality of the policy that was implemented by uh, President Obama. Would you care to reiterate that position today? Well, the president, you know, President Obama uh, indicated multiple times that he felt that DACA, he didn't have the power to do DACA in the way it was done. And uh, eventually, they must have changed their mind and, and executed this policy to take persons who are in the country unlawfully and to give them lawful status, work permits, and even participation in Social Security. So uh, I felt for some time that that was not proper. A federal district court in Texas so held, and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals also so held that it was in unlawful. So what happened was uh, we helped work on the research, but the Department of Homeland Security withdrew the policy because it was not defensible in my view. And established a date to close it down of uh, March 5th, I think, of next year? That's right. The Homeland Security asked for time to wind this program down, um, and uh, I thought that was appropriate. And uh, there's a lot of public dialogue about what kind of legislation might be passed uh, in, in conjunction with the DACA policy. And that's up in the air right now. I'm noticing that Democrats are saying we're going to have everything we want on DACA or we'll shut the government down. So it causes me to think about what should happen if Congress reaches an impasse and there is no passage of any legislation to extend the DACA policy. If the president should decide on, on or before that March 5th date, around that period of time that he wants to extend the DACA policy, what would your position be at that time? Well, that's hypothetical, um, Senator uh, King. I'm not, I don't think I should speculate on that. Um, but I do think Congress uh, will have to uh, uh, give it thought. Uh, we have a law now. It's in place. It's Congress passed, and Congress would have to change it. And um, 
I would just remark that I'm watching a lot of people be rewarded for violation of the rule of law, and I appreciate your emphasis on rule of law in your, in your testimony today, multiple times coming back to that point. Mr. King, I would just say it is correct in my view, and I think you probably share it, that uh, something is lost whenever you provide an amnesty. It's a price will be paid if that's done, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, circumstances are such it may need to be done, but we need to be careful. Uh, thank you. And um, it's been, we've been made aware here in this committee that there's a significant backlog in immigration cases. Um, have you presented any request uh, to Congress or a, or a statement that uh, could inform us as to how many resources you might need, how many judges you might need to get this backlog caught up, and then uh, an idea how many we might need to maintain an anticipated level? That's a very good question. Yes, we've worked on it. We have some preliminary uh, information. We're seeking a, a total of about 360, 70 judges. We've added about 50 uh, uh, to the total. Uh, we've uh, shortened the time process for selecting people, not shorting the training program. And we'll, we're adding judges. Uh, I would say uh, on the backlog, it's gone up dramatically. It's now over 600,000. But the last two or three months, we're almost not adding to the backlog. And I'm told by the additional work we're doing by January, uh, we will not be adding to the backlog, but hopefully reducing it. That would be a, a real change in the trends that we were heading on. Well, thank you. Then I just ask you to reflect as uh, this committee anticipates the potential of a special counsel to broaden this look that I think is forced upon us uh, in a reluctant way, but I certainly support the special counsel, uh, to, to look back at, um, at some times here that I believe should be incorporated into this. Um, and that is, uh, I look back at October 16th, 2015, when Barack Obama was speaking of um, Hillary Clinton and whether she, um, whether she might have violated any, uh, uh, any, uh, in, in, any uh, security clauses in our statute, in particular um, 18 U.S.C. 793, um, when he said that he had no impression that Mrs. Clinton had purposely tried to hide something or to squirrel away any information made the point of intent. Uh, behind that, in April after that, April 10th, a similar statement. She would never, meaning Hillary Clinton, she would never intentionally put America in any kind of jeopardy. Those words of intent caught my intention when I heard James Comey use that very word July 5th of 2016, and it seems as though he latched on to the statements made by President Obama and they more or less implied and implemented it into an interpretation of the statute, that word intent as if it were a condition uh, before there could be any prosecution for a violation of 18 U.S.C. 793. And I, if, I, I don't know that I have a question on that. I want to make sure that I put that into the record so that it's under consideration by the DOJ. Time of the gentleman has expired. Yeah. Chair recognize the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, for five minutes. I thank you very much. Uh, Mr. General, uh, do you believe in this book, the Constitution of the United States? Yes. And will abide by it with all of your intentions? That's exactly correct. I, I thank you so very much. Exactly. Uh, I took the liberty of reviewing federal crimes against children, particularly those dealing with sexual or physical abuse. As you well know, Lee Kaufman, Wendy Miller, Debbie Watson Gibson, uh, Gloria Thacker Deason, and Beverly Young Nelson, these young women, have accused uh, this individual, Judge Moore, who is running for a federal office, the United States Senate, of child sexual activity. Do you believe these young women? I am, uh, have no reason to doubt these young women. And with that in mind, if you believe these young women, do you believe Judge Moore should be seated uh, in the Senate if he wins? And would you introduce investigations by the DOJ regarding his actions? We will uh, evaluate every case as to whether or not it should be uh, investigated. This kind of case would normally be a state case. Uh, I would say, uh, Representative uh, uh, Jackson Lee, that the uh, ethics people at the Department of Justice, and I've talked to them about that when this campaign started, it's the seat I used to hold, that they advised me that the Attorney General should not be involved in this campaign, 
I have thank friends you, in the campaign. Thank you, Mr. General. I, I have, have steadfastly adhered to I want to make sure that, that if he view, comes to the United States Senate, I think Senate, I should continue to do so. If he comes to the United States Senate, uh, that there would be the possibility of referring his case uh, for at least a federal review by the Department of Justice. We will do our duty. Uh, let me also refer you back to the meeting on March 31st, 2016 with Mr. Papadopoulos. Um, you well know that Mr. Papadopoulos, in addition to his comments in the meeting uh, regarding a meeting between Trump and Mr. Putin, had series of meetings uh, dealing with, and as you can see, Trump, Mr. Papadopoulos, and you leading that committee. I cannot imagine your memory would fail you so much. But moving on, uh, he was in that meeting, but you also had Stephen Miller, who is a senior policy advisor, who was noted in, in the stipulated statement of offense to receive conversations from Mr. Papadopoulos about his uh, constant interaction with the Russians to intrude in the 2016 election. You continued in the October 18th meeting before the Judiciary Committee or hearing in the Senate uh, to not answer the question. Now, in light of the facts that are now part of the record, do you wish to change your testimony before the Senate Intelligence Committee on June 13, 2017, where you said, I have never met with or had any conversation with any Russians or any foreign officials? Let me jump to the final part. Well, I, I have, no knowledge, I have I... no knowledge of any such conversations by anyone connected to the Trump campaign. Do you want to admit under oath that you did not tell the truth or misrepresented, or do you want to correct your testimony right now? You're referring to my testimony at confirmation. Before the Senate Intelligence Committee, my time is short, and I have two more questions, please. Well, I'm not able to respond because I don't think I understand what you were saying. I'm asking your Intelligence Committee testimony, do you want to change it where you indicated you had no knowledge of, in, of involvement of the Trump uh, individuals involved in conversations regarding the Trump campaign Russians? And Mr. Miller uh, gave, uh, supported uh, Mr. Trump's um, press conference where he said, Russia, if you're listening, I hope you'll be able to find the 30,000 emails. Do you want to change your testimony that was uh, where you said, I have no knowledge of any such conversations by anyone connected to the Trump campaign regarding Russians involved in the campaign? That was uh, a testimony on June 13. I'm not able to understand. All right, let me move forward to the Let me idea. say this, Mr. Chairman. Can I? Uh, the yes, black no. identity, witness, let me move to uh, a document to that you have prepared. The the, the gentleman keeps saying he cannot recall, he cannot recall, so I'm reclaiming my time. The gentleman will suspend. The, the witness wants to answer the question she asked. And I should be given extra time, and I do not have extra time. Let me move well, well, to the, the black The gentleman will famous. suspend. I will the suspend. witness will answer the question. Yes or no? Does he want to change his testimony in the Intelligence Committee? I would just say this. I stand by this testimony at the Intelligence Committee. <laughs> I have never met with or had any conversation with any Russians or any foreign officials concerning any type of interference with the campaign or election in the United States. Further, I have no knowledge of any such conversations by anyone connected to the Trump campaign. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, now, what I did say in my opening statement, I explained that when I was asked uh, in October, just a few weeks ago, when I was asked uh, about the matter, uh, did I have any knowledge of anyone who had uh, talked with, to the Russians, I indicated um, uh, that I had not recall that meeting when that occurred. But I would have been pleased to have uh, responded uh, and explained it if I'd recalled it. I've tried to be honest about that and give you my best response uh, and did throughout all the testimony I've given. Ms. Lee. You stand by your testimony. Thank you very much. Are you familiar with the names Eric Garner, Walter Scott, Jameer Rice? My question is, as I hold up the poster dealing with the report under your jurisdiction, black identity extremists, uh, it is interesting to me that you are opposing individuals who are opposing lethal force, similar to the attack on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King on COINTELPRO, but there seems to be no report dealing with the Tiki Torch Parade in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us. Why is there an attack on black activists versus any reports dealing with the alt-right and the white nationalists? Can you answer that question quickly? I'm not aware. Are you aware planning of... on investigating that? When was that report completed? In August of 2017. 
I'm not aware of, I have not studied that report. I ask you to because it's an attack on individuals who are simply trying to petition the government in a redress of grievances. Let me move to criminal justice reform. Um, we have found that mandatory minimums uh, and over incarceration uh, has been the history of criminal justice. We were moving toward criminal justice reform, which you oppose as the United States Senator. Um, and now you intend to return toward discredited Nixon era law and order criminal justice policies going to make America great or not or waste precious taxpayer dollars. Do you have any interest in rehabilitating those incarcerated, recognizing that mandatory minimums created the opportunity for over incarceration rather than telling your prosecutors to prosecute on every single crime? Is there any opportunity to work with your office to deal with progressive ways of dealing with criminal justice reform at this time? Yes or no? Yes. All right. I would just respond and say that Senator Durbin and I worked together to reduce the crack cocaine penalties uh, some years ago. It probably remains well, largest. Will you pull back on the, time, the time of the gentlewoman has expired. The witness is allowed to answer to the last question. Minimums. I'm sorry. The time of the gentlewoman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Issa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Sessions, it's, it's good to see you again. Yes, sir. Um, I, uh, I don't speak Russian, and, and I don't meet with, with Russians, and I don't really want to ask about those questions today, but I do have some very important questions. Well, Congressman Issa, you said that, but I bet you have met with some Russian, and if you in your lifetime and taking those words at face value, somebody might accuse you of not being honest. You're absolutely That's you're, what they've done to me. You're absolutely right, General Sessions, that uh, that, that is the challenge is that uh, as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I meet with lots of ambassadors and uh, uh, I don't want to try to remember everyone and everything that was discussed in what I thought was a performa meeting. But uh, there are a couple of areas that are left over from the previous administration that I'd like to talk to you about. One of them is we sent Loretta Lynch, General Lynch, uh, a letter related to sober homes and a, a predicament. And the predicament is fairly straightforward. If, uh, and, and her answer, to be honest, to Chairman Goodlatte and the rest of us was not satisfactory, and we've given your staff a copy of it. Uh, essentially, sober living homes are nothing but boarding houses. They're required to provide no care whatsoever to the alcoholic or recovering drug abuser uh, because that has to be done somewhere else or they don't qualify as sober homes. And yet, currently, there is uh, in the Ninth Circuit decisions that cause cities to be unable to regulate them in a way that would prevent people from simply buying houses in a row in a very prestigious neighborhood and turning them into uh, these, uh, if you will, sober living homes, which are, again, boarding houses with 15 or more people. Will you agree to work with us to try to find an appropriate way to align your enforcement of the Americans with Disability Act and your enforcement of the Fair Housing Act with the necessity for cities to be able to essentially regulate uh, who, how many people live in a home. Yes, I would be pleased to do that. These I'm, are important uh, yes. issues because a lot of money is being spent and some of it not wisely in these areas. A lot of it is federal dollars being squandered by, uh, to the benefit of people that are speculating. The second one is in a trial court ruling in the Durante Nursery versus American, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers case. Are you even familiar with this case? I'm not. Well, I'd like you to become familiar because during your administration, um, a assistant U.S. attorney on your behalf argued uh, that the waters of the U.S which is not a valid regulation delivered to Congress and eligible under CRA to be considered or rejected, uh, continue to argue that that was law. Would you agree that your attorneys on your behalf should not argue regulations which have not been delivered to Congress and as a result are not eligible for CRA review? Uh, Mr. Issa, I have now recalled the case. Um, I didn't call it by name. Uh, that matter was intensely reviewed by a new um, assistant attorney general for the uh, acting, uh, right. at least, for the um, Environment and Natural Resources Division. After great consideration, uh, we felt uh, I, it was advised to me, and I approved going forward with that position in court. So I will take responsibility for it, but I got to tell you, we did look at it very hard. But in general, you would agree that if a regulation is created or 
some other words of the executive branch, they don't have the weight of law unless they're delivered to Congress, so we have an opportunity to review them under the Congressional Review Act. That would sound correct. Thank you. My last question uh, is less of a softball, and neither one of these are softball. They're very important to California. But uh, in a previous Congress, the Ways and Com Means Committee of the United States House voted for and referred criminal charges against Lois Lerner. I also was involved in investigating her wrongful activity. They referred criminal charges, and they did so under a statute that says, and I'll paraphrase it as well as I can, that the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia shall present to the grand jury the following, and then they laid out the criminal charges. The previous Attorney General ordered the U.S. Attorney or U.S. Attorney in District made a decision not to enforce that. Now, the statute as we understand it is not a statute that says you will look at this and decide independently. It actually says it shall be presented to the grand jury. Will you commit to review that and if you agree with us as to what the statute says, and we think it's pretty plain English, uh, order a U.S. attorney to present to a grand jury, and if they no bill it, fine, but in fact to present it consistent with congressional and statutory law. I will review that more personally, but the Department of Justice view has been it takes a full vote of the House uh, to accomplish uh, that act and i'm not sure where that leaves us but i will give it a personal review which i have not done mr chairman point. if you can stop the clock for just one second uh, uh, no. if if the entire house voted to the time of the gentleman the, US the time of the gentleman has expired the chair recognizes the gentleman from tennessee mr cohen for five minutes thank you sir mr attorney general first uh, i noted you went to the 50th anniversary of the selma Alabama March, Selma Montgomery, yes. I commend you for that, and you were a sponsor of the gold medal for those folks that marched. Uh, having done that, I would like to ask you, what have you done as Attorney General to see to it that African Americans and others who have been discriminated for years in voting have more access to the ballot box? We will absolutely, resolutely defend the right of all Americans to vote, including our African American brothers and sisters. It cannot ever be suggested that uh, people are blocked from voting. And we have uh, done a number of things uh, in the Department of Justice. Let me ask you this, Mr. Attorney General. It's, it's a fact, there have been studies to show, that voter ID is more discriminatory in its effect on African Americans and Latinos than anything else. Will you stop in defending voter ID law cases? No. Um, the Supreme Court has approved voter ID if properly done. Other courts have too. It can be done in a discriminatory way, which is not proper and should not be approved. Let but me I believe it's settled law that, it, that a properly handled and written voter ID law is, is Let me lawful. suggest to sir, with all due respect, we come from the similar region. I think we have a greater responsibility than anybody else in this country to see to it that African Americans get a chance at the ballot. When they were discriminated against, they were slaves for 200 and plus years, they were under Jim Crow, they weren't allowed to vote, and they're still being discriminated against. And I would submit to you and ask you to look at voter ID laws, access to the ballot, election day voting, early voting, and other indices that will allow people to vote that have been stopped. Secondly, on marijuana, you said that, that you are basically doing the same as Holder and Lynch. I believe General Holder and General Lynch ab abided by congressional appropriations that limited the Justice Department in enforcing marijuana laws where states had passed laws on medical marijuana and others. Uh, are you, will you abide by congressional appropriations, limitations on marijuana when it conflict with state laws? I believe we're bound by that. Um, Thank you, sir. That's, that's great. That's great. And I saw you, you, what you did on crack cocaine was good. It wasn't as good as it could have been. Your proposal was a 20 to 1 ratio. Mr. Durbin's was a 10 to 1 ratio. Y'all decided on 18 to 1. You were a good negotiator, but Mr. Durbin took what he could get. But it should have been 1 to 1. But you, you, you admitted in that hearing that it could discriminate against the, the disparity against African Americans and minorities, and you ought to look at that. I would, well, I would just say th that the net effect of that legislation was to significantly it was good, reduce uh, the 
uh, penalty one is subjected to for uh, dealing with crack cocaine. Yes, sir, and that was good. That may be a better uh, analysis than the 18 to 1 or whatever it is. It's generally considered a more dangerous drug. Marijuana is not as dangerous as heroin. Would you agree with that? I think that's correct. Well, thank you, sir. I would hope that in your enforcement that you would look at the limitations you've got. There's always an opportunity cost, and put your opportunity cost, your enforcement on, mar on, on crack, on cocaine, on meth, on opioids, and on heroin. Marijuana is the least bothersome of all. 28 states or 29 states in the District of Columbia have legalized it for medical purposes. Eight states in the District of Columbia for recreational purposes. Justice Brandeis famously said that the states are the laboratories of democracy. I would hope you'd look at marijuana and look at the states as laboratories of democracy and see how they've helped. In states where they've got medical marijuana, they have 25 percent less opioid use. It gives people a way to relieve pain without using opioids, which inevitably leads to death and crime. And so I would hope you take a look at that. We will take a look at it, and we'll be looking at some rigorous analysis of uh, the marijuana uh, usage and how it plays out. I'm not as uh, optimistic as you. you. You'd said one time that good people don't smoke marijuana. Which of these people would say are not good people? Well, let me answer, explain let how me that me. occurred. All right. And I explain? Quickly. Uh, John, Kasich, I talked John about Kasich a good person? George Pataki, Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich, Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush, George Bush, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Judge Clarence Thomas. Which of those are not good people? Let me tell you how that came about, Congressman. Uh, so the question was, what do you do about drug use, the epidemic we're seeing in the country, and how you reverse it? Part of that is a cultural thing. I explained how, when I became United States Attorney in 1981, uh, and the drugs were being used widely over a period of years. It became unfashionable, unpopular, and people were seen, and it was seen as such that good people didn't use marijuana. What that was the those? context of that statement. It might have affected I'm the short-term memory. What years were those? Do you recognize the gentleman? <laughs> One last Ohio, question, Mr. Alabama Mr. or Auburn? The, the gentleman. War Eagle. <laughs> time has expired. The, oh. No. Although I went to law I school, I love Alabama. I recognize the Mr. Jordan, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, did the FBI pay Christopher Steele? Where am I? Right here. Yeah. Did Excuse the me. FBI pay Christopher Steele, the author of the dossier? Uh, those are matters you'll have to uh, direct to the, um, uh, I think, maybe the special counsel. And why is that? It's just, I'm just asking if someone well, I'm not the payroll able the FBI. to uh, reveal uh, internal investigatory uh, matters you know, in, uh, here that's under the investigation of anybody, but particularly, I think, the... This happened uh, in the summer of 2016. We know the Clinton campaign, the Democrat National Committee, paid through a law firm, Fusion GPS, to produce the dossier. We know the author was Christopher Steele. It's been reported that he was on the payroll of the FBI. I'm just wanting to know if, in fact, that is the case. I'm not able to provide an answer to you. Did the FBI present the dossier to the FISA court? I'm not able to answer that. Do you know if the FBI did the established process protocol in evaluating claims made in the dossier? I'm not able to answer that. On January 6, then FBI Director James Comey briefed President-elect Trump up in New York about the dossier. Shortly thereafter, that the fact that that meeting took place and the subject of the meeting was the dossier was leaked to CNN. Do you know who leaked that information? I do not. Are you investigating who leaked that information? That would be a matter within the investigatory uh, powers of the special counsel. You said you got Department a number of, of investigations Justice. going on, Mr. Attorney General, regarding leaks. Is that likely one of those that you're investigating? I'm not able to reveal the existence of investigations or not. Mr. Attorney General, I, I, I appreciate your service in the Senate. I appreciate your service at the Justice Department. Uh, consider you a friend. Um, and frankly, I appreciate yesterday's letter saying you were considering um, appointing a special counsel that you sent to us. But my concern is we sent you a letter three and a half months ago asking for a second special counsel. And if you're now just considering it, I, I, what's it going to take to get a special counsel? We know that 
We know that former FBI Director James Comey misled the American people in the summer of 2016 when he called the Clinton investigation a matter. It's obviously an investigation. We know FBI Director Comey was drafting an exoneration letter before the investigation was complete. We know Loretta Lynch, one day before the Benghazi report came out, five days before Secretary Clinton was scheduled to be interviewed by the FBI, met with former President Bill Clinton on a tarmac in Phoenix. Um, we know after that meeting, when she was corresponding with public relations people at the Justice Department, she was using the name Elizabeth Carlisle. You know, as I've said before, it seems to me if you're just talking golf and grandkids, you can probably use your real name. We know that Mr. Comey publicized the investigation, and we know he made the final decision on whether to prosecute or not. And then when he gets fired, he leaks a government document through a friend to the New York Times, and what was his goal? To create momentum for a special counsel, and of course it can't just be any special counsel, it's got to be Bob Mueller, his best friend, his predecessor, his mentor. The same Bob Mueller who was involved, we've now learned, in this whole investigation with the informant regarding uh, Russian businesses wanting to do business in the Iranian business here in the United States regarding the Iranian One deal. So I guess my main question is, what's it going to take if all that, not to mention the dossier information, what's it going to take to actually get a special counsel? It will take a factual basis that meets the standards of the appointment of a special and is counsel. That, is that analysis going on right now? Well, it's in the uh, manual of the Department of Justice about what's required. We've only had two. The first one was the Waco, Janet Reno, uh, Senator Danforth, who took over that investigation as special counsel, and Mr. Mueller. Each yep. of those are pretty uh, special factual situations. Let me ask it this and way. And we will use the proper standards, and that's what I only thing I can tell you, Mr. Jordan. Well, I, I appreciate that. You can that, have your ask... idea, but sometime we have to study what the facts are and to evaluate so, whether it meets the standard well said. that so requires let me ask you this. If in fact, a special counsel. Well, we know one fact. We know the Clinton campaign, the Democrat National Committee paid for, uh, through the law firm, paid for the dossier. We know that happened. And it sure looks like the FBI was paying the author of that document, and it sure looks like a major political party was working with the federal government to then turn an opposition research document, the equivalent of some National Enquirer story, into an intelligence document, take that to the FISA court so that they could then get a warrant to spy on Americans associated with President Trump's campaign. That's what it looks like. And I'm asking you, doesn't that warrant, in addition to all the things we know about James Comey in 2016, doesn't that warrant naming a second special counsel, as 20 members of this committee wrote you three and a half months ago asking you to do. Well, Mr. Comey is no longer the director of the FBI. Thank goodness. We have an excellent man of integrity and ability in Chris Ray, and I think he's going to do an outstanding job, and I'm very happy about that. He's not here today, that. Attorney General. And I would say, you time are, and I'm asking for a special counsel. The time of the gentleman And I would say expired. looks like is not enough basis to appoint a special counsel. Time of the gentleman has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, General. Uh, you have led a remarkable and notable career over the last 42 years as an attorney in private practice, as the Attorney General of Alabama, then the U.S. Attorney in Alabama, later the uh, U.S. Senator of Alabama, and now the Attorney General of the United States of America. And you made a professional judgment call when you uh, recused yourself uh, from the investigation of the Russian interference in the 2016 elections, and you've caught a lot of flack for that decision. What I want to know is, why did you recuse yourself? Well, thank you very much. Um, I told the Senate Judiciary Committee when I was confirmed uh, that I would evaluate those matters. I would seek the counsel of the senior ethics advisor. No, my question is, why did you recuse yourself? Well, I'll get that. So I, I don't want I, you to filibuster. Okay. For, um, I just so I did why. do that. I evaluated that. And they showed me something I was not familiar with, one of the Code of Federal Regulations. It says if you participate uh, in, in a substantial role in a campaign, a Department of Justice employee should not participate in investigating that right. campaign. Thank you. I felt that was uh, correct. It was not because I had I any concern about anything I had done previously, 
but it was, uh, to me, if I were not bound by that, I don't see how other people in the Department of Justice could be expected to follow the rules of the department either. Well, thank you, sir. And after you recused yourself, you did participate in the firing of the FBI director who was leading the investigation into the Russian interference with the 2016 elections. Prior to Jim Comey's termination, were you contacted by the Donald Trump administration, anyone in that administration, Donald Trump himself or any of his political or campaign officials about uh, their quest to fire Jim Comey? I am not able to um, and cannot uh, reveal conversations with the um, um, President of the United States or his top advisors. Let me ask you this question. Uh, with regards to the AT&T proposed acquisition of Time Warner, which owns CNN, it appears to be a vertical merger, much like the Comcast-NBC-Universal merger that DOJ approved. But unlike uh, its treatment of Comcast NBC Universal, DOJ has suggested strongly that it will not approve the AT&T Time Warner merger unless Time Warner sells off CNN's parent company, uh, uh, Turner Broadcasting. Uh, it's well known that uh, your boss, President Trump, has great disdain for CNN, which he calls fake news, and uh, what I want to know is, has the White House or any individual in or on behalf of the Trump administration or the Trump political team or campaign, excluding staff from FCC or DOJ, uh, has anybody contacted you, your office or your assigns regarding that AT&T Time Warner acquisition? First, I would say that I don't um, accept and cannot accept the accuracy of that news report. Um, we have a professional... So your, your, your department has not told uh, uh, Time Warner that an AT&T that they must uh, shed Turner Broadcasting? Our work uh, is professional. They do meet with the... Uh, is that a false report or is it a true report? I just would tell you, I don't think it's, uh, I'm able to accept as accurate right. news reports I that you. have been come out on that. Let me ask you this question. On October 18th, when testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Sass asked you if the department had taken adequate action to prevent election meddling in the future. You stated that there was no review underway of the cybersecurity vulnerabilities. Have you requested a review of what laws need to be updated in order to protect our elections from foreign influence? We have discussed those matters, but uh, no completion has been done. Are you conducting FB, a review at this time? Yes. Our team is looking at that. Uh, the FBI has real skills in that area. What individual? And I think we are not anywhere near where I would like us to be right. yet. Well, let me ask Mr. you this Johnson. question. What individual with your department is leading that uh, inquiry? We would be uh, uh, con uh, working with our voting rights section, uh, our criminal section, our national security section, probably is uh, the most knowledgeable in the hacking and area, as well as the um, expertise in the FBI. I'm the gentleman Thank has you. expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, first of all, I want to thank you for all your efforts to restore the rule of law. Uh, nothing could be more important to our justice system, and nothing could be more important to uh, protecting the lives of Americans and, uh, uh, and, frankly, not just protecting the lives, but keeping all Americans safe. Uh, in particular, many of us appreciate your efforts to crack down on sanctuary cities that blatantly ignore federal immigration laws, to combat criminal gangs that prey on our communities, to return to robust prosecutions of drug cases, to protect children from dangerous child predators, and to safeguard religious liberties that are enshrined in our Constitution. I'd like to go back for a second to sanctuary cities. I have been waiting 20 years 
for a president and an administration that would enforce current immigration laws. So happens that I introduced a bill in 1996 with Senator Al Simpson and that, among other things, outlawed sanctuary cities. So the law is there, and I want to thank you for being willing to enforce that law, which will protect many uh, innocent Americans from harm and perhaps uh, save their lives. Uh, more generally, I'd like to ask you if you feel that there are any immigration laws, and if so, which ones, that need to be better enforced? There absolutely are, and um, maybe even some improved. Uh, I know you've worked on that, and the chairman has worked on that with some excellent legislation. I totally believe that uh, the professional legislation, I know the chairman has worked on and you've worked on, uh, would be tremendously helpful. We, we've got to deal with numbers. And so uh, when you create a mechanism by which whole, we had 5,000 in people in um, uh, 2005 who claimed uh, a credible fear. Uh, last year, it was 95,000. This is creating hearings and, and backlogs that were never intended to be part of the system. Did not happen before. And so there's so many things out there that burden our law enforcement officers, make it more difficult, more expensive, more uh, lengthy to complete these things. Uh, it, we've just got to make up our mind. We've got to make up our mind. Do we want a lawful system of immigration that serves the national interest? Or do we want open borders and we're not going to enforce it? Thank you for your leadership, Mr. Smith. I know you'll be leaving this uh, body also, and I've enjoyed so much the honor of working with you. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Attorney General. I'm not going to ask any questions, and I'm going to end with that, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. The Chair, thanks, gentlemen. We're going to take a break, Attorney General, session, so the committee will stand in recess for 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, roll time.